And I'll say this, it's, uh, it's awful hard to preach after a service like we had today. I'd rather preach first than let him do his thing and, and have that good one after I got done. Because uh, <clears throat> that's, that's a tough act to follow now. No kidding. I don't mean act in that. I mean, it's just, you know, just tough to follow something like that. And I wanted, he, he asked me this afternoon on the way out, will you preach for me? And I, oh, yeah, I'd be glad to. And I wanted to go home and pull out something I've already preached a few times and, uh, you know, one that I was familiar with and kind of a sugar stick, you know, and come here and preach Jesus coming again, hallelujah, and, you know, that kind of thing, and get a little wound up. And uh, it didn't work out that way. Uh, and I told this uh, Alton over here, I, was, I just wasn't paying attention, and I was talking with him. Now, this one's for you, brother. It isn't really, because this isn't one of them fun things at all. Okay, this is going to be a difficult one. It's not specifically for you. So when I said that, you just go ahead and forget that. Uh, it's for all of us. <clears throat> and I, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll go ahead and tell you what I'm preaching on tonight. Uh, and I have about as big a burden for this kind of stuff as Brother Alton does, but it won't show on me. Uh, my, my emotional makeup is something's busted in there, and it doesn't work like it should work. So I'm, I'm not going to, I won't. You know, weep, and I won't, you know, break out and to shouting and stuff. But the burden is there. God's people need to hear what God's word has to say, and uh, and it'll make a difference in your life. There's a couple things that have been said tonight that kind of lead into this. The song that the uh, the three of them sang here a minute ago. One line in it was something about being overwhelmed. Uh, I hadn't been overwhelmed lately. I've been whelmed pretty good, but not overwhelmed. Uh, God's been able to see me through the things that I go through. He's been good to me that way, and always is and always has been good to me. I feel like a spoiled child somewhere along the way. I feel like I'm God's child, but I feel like an only child sometimes. He's just been so good to me in so many different ways. Uh, the other sister, Karen, said, uh, glad to announce that I'm saved. I'd like to say to you, me too. I'm saved on the way to heaven and, uh, and rejoicing in that very thing. I can hardly wait for my time to get over there. Uh, I'm not going to do anything radical and out of the ordinary to get there, but if he takes me tonight, it'll be all right with me. I'm ready to go and getting kind of anxious. The, the closer I get, the more anxious I get about this very thing. <clears throat> Here we go. <clears throat> I can't think of anything else that I need to say to introduce this and get going, so let's just get going. <clears throat> I'm, I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm preaching on hypocrisy tonight. Somebody said, oh my goodness, I came back for this. <laughs> I could have just stayed home and stayed on the mountaintop. Not that bad, really. Hypocrisy is something that, uh, it, that affects Christians and affects everybody. And I think that we'd all agree that we live in a, in a, a world that is eat up with sham and hypocrisy and phony and fake. Uh, we, we live in it and we live with it and we see it every day. And just about every Christian uh, that takes a, a look at themselves for just a little while will say, man, I hope I'm not that hypocrite they talk about. I hope I'm not the one. I hope I, hope I can live a life that's straight ahead and... I don't want to be the one that people point at and say, eh, he doesn't live like what he talks about. Uh, we want to be uh, straight on. And so I'm going to preach a little bit on hypocrisy tonight. <clears throat> the, 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 the time of, the timing is absolutely perfect. About three or four more weeks, there's going to be some little people about like this. And they're going to put on a little costume and a little mask, and they're going to be something for a little while that they're not normally, Okay. Most of the little people I know like this, they're kind of devilish when you get right down to it. But they're going to dress up like little princesses and little angels and stuff. And then they're going to go door to door and they're going to shake down everybody in the community. Okay? <laughs> you got something I want? Fill her up. Okay? And there'll be, there'll be some folks that'll they just eat that stuff. Oh, isn't she so cute? And the big old beer belly guy and the wife beaters pour all the candy in there. And then shout over his son, honey, get the wallet. And this isn't enough. Give me, let's give this child more. <clears throat> and you won't believe this. That's the way little people do on October 31st. 
And we expect it. We understand it. It's going to happen. And, that, and that's okay. But eight days later, some folks that aren't so little, some bigger people, they're going to put on their little uniform and they're going to put on their mask and they're going to say, today's the day. Vote for me. Take a look at this. Honesty. Take a look at these arms. They want to embrace you and be, be compassionate to you and I want to do what's good for you. You know what I'm saying. There's no question that we live in an age of phony, hypocrisy, lying, sham, disguise of every kind. And now the really, really, really sad thing is coming now. Buckle up. You ready? It happens in the church. I hate to say that. What I'd like to say is it happens in some churches, but not West Side. Okay? I'd like to say that, but since we're all sinners saved by grace and we all still got that sin nature, I'd be willing to just almost bet that there's some folk even in our crowd that might be touched a little bit by hypocrisy. I want to give you a definition of hypocrisy. And I'm sorry this isn't more exciting than what it, than what it could have been, but, uh, but I, I believe it'll be good for us. I'll give you the definition. Real simple. I'm not going to go into a 14-word Greek study, something or another. I'm just give you a, a simple definition because that way you and I can handle it. You ready? Behavior that does not agree with what someone claims to believe. You got it? Here's what I say I believe, but here's how I behave. If the two are not in agreement, if they don't coincide, then you got a little case of hypocrisy going on. And so, um, we, it's just strange how God does things. Okay, He didn't keep me up all night to give me this, but this morning in Sunday school, we were uh, in Psalm 127, and one of the things that we looked at was the word vain. Three times in that psalm, the word vain is used. And so I defined vain this morning. And vain is the same, the same kind of vain as don't take the Lord's name in vain. And so we had a little, a little session this morning, a little mini session in our class on taking the Lord's name in vain. The word vain means worthless, valueless, lie, falsehood. And I told my class, and they're the best group in the house. I, I'm, boy, oh boy, I got a good class, good folk. But I told us this morning that sometimes when we say on Sunday, I love Jesus, I'm going to serve the Lord, I love God. This is wonderful. And then we go out on Monday through Saturday and our life doesn't line up with what we said that we believe and what we said that we, uh, that our actions. I say I love the Lord, but then I get out and, and, I, and I'm kind of living like the world out here. What I have done is said, that God thing that I said back here, apparently it was a lie. Because my living doesn't, doesn't match my saying. And when those two don't match up, what I have done is I have devalued my God. I have brought Him down and I have made Him the lie. When I say He can change my life and He's, he's birthed me into His family and I'm now born again, saved, and I love the Lord, that's what I say. And then if I go out here and act differently, what I do is I devalue what God, what I said God had done. I don't want to do that in my personal life, and I don't think you want to either. But taking the Lord's name in vain is the same, it's, it's on the same level with hypocrisy that we're talking about. It's the same process. And so this is going to be so easy, and I'm not going to take all night to do this. I'm going to give you about three or four things about hypocrisy, about three or four things about being a disciple. And then we're going to have this be one of them Home, Home Depot Christian kind of things where you do it yourself. I'm just going to dish out some truth for you 
and then you will decide what to do with it. Let me give you a quote. Let me find it first. That, this isn't real fresh for me here. Hold on. Um, here it is. This is just kind of a picture of hypocrisy. You ready for this? Now, it's got a big word in it, so I'll tell you what the big word means. The big word is bewail. And it means to wail loudly, as in mourning. You know? Over in Israel, they hire people to cry for them. They hire people to come mourn at funerals because, well, we don't have a real big family. We won't make much noise if we're the only ones crying. So let's hire in some, some extras and we'll bring them in. We'll pay them good money and they'll do all the crying and the moaning for us. Okay? Bewail. Now, you ready for this? This is anonymous. I don't know who said it, but it's probably good that it's anonymous. Buzzards bewail the dead sheep. Then they eat them. Did you get that? Here's the buzzard mourning and bewailing the dead sheep. Nobody's looking. Let's chow down, boys. And they eat them. I'm sad to say that sometimes we as God's children, we may not be bewailing something, but we got a big mouth and a big voice and a big idea that we promote. But then it's just like the buzzards. We promote the idea. Nobody's looking. Now, now different. Okay. Hypocrisy. Let me give you... You know what I learned from you? You know what I learned from you the other day? I don't have to announce a text. I don't have to turn to the text. I can just do anything I want to. <laughs> he did that the other day, and he was laughing about it. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and give you the text, and we're going to turn to it, and I'm going to actually read the text. And uh, <clears throat> I've learned some things from him, but not enough yet. I just can't add lib very good. I have to have some notes. 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 3 through 6. Here's what you want to be looking for. Two things. Hypocrite and disciple of Jesus. Beginning in verse 3. Hereby we do know that we know Him, Jesus, if we keep His commandments, Jesus' commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. But, here it comes. Here's the other side. But, whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. It, it grows up. It's matured. It's developed. So here's a guy that keeps his word, keeps the word of Jesus. In him, in that person, the love of God is, is developing all the time. Hereby know we that we are in him. Listen again. He that saith he abideth in him, in Christ, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked, even as Christ walked. If I say on Sunday morning, or Sunday night, or Wednesday night, amongst the crowd over here, hey, I love the Lord. I'm following Him. I'm walking with Him. If that be the case in my statement, then my walk ought to match it and if it does not match it, John said this, now not me. I'm a liar, and the truth is not in me. I want to tell you something else about hypocrisy, and then I want to do just a little tiny bit of preaching. We say hypocrisy. Well, you know, he's kind of a hypocrite. You know, he says one thing and then does something else, and we kind of gloss over it. We, we let it kind of slide. John is letting nothing slide. He said, if a person doesn't do what they say, they are a liar and the truth is not in them. And folk, I'm here to announce tonight that hypocrisy is something that is mighty important to the Christian life, the Christian walk, and we cannot be a Christian that's faithful and good and just if we are acting hypocritically. I'm going to tell you something that's a little later in here, but I want to say it now while I'm thinking about it because I could skip it in my notes. If you take hypocrisy out to the extreme, if you define hypocrisy the way it ought to be, a hypocrite is one who is lost. A hypocrite says, I'm saved, 
but I act like this. The person who is a genuine hypocrite, okay, a, a pedigreed, a thoroughbred hypocrite, that person is not saved. They are a liar. The truth is not in them. They say one thing, and they are something different. A Christian can't be a hypocrite, but we act like a hypocrite. I am so thrilled and happy tonight that I can announce to you, I am not a hypocrite and never will be a hypocrite. I wish I could announce right behind that, I'll never act the part of a hypocrite. Oh, I'll never do that. But I can't say that because you know what? Sometimes me, sometimes you. We say one thing, and then we don't live just exactly like we said. We are playing the part of the hypocrite. Okay? That's why this is such serious business. Okay? This is not just something to make you, uh, well, you know what, I think I'll just quit my hypocrisy, and, and I'll be over that guy. And So many people out in the world, they blame the hypocrite for them not coming to church. I'm not going because the church is so full of hypocrites. Well, the church may have a hypocrite or two in it, but we got more than a few that may be acting the part of a hypocrite. And I'll tell you, like my old buddy Bobby Hardwick used to say, old <clears throat> Bobby said, he was talking to one of his members one time about hypocrisy. The member said, I'm not coming anymore. Church is full of hypocrites. I'm just not coming. And old Bobby, kind of wise, he's kind of a smart fellow, <clears throat> country as could be, but anyway, <clears throat> Bobby said, let me tell you something, Buster. If you're not coming because the hypocrite's over there, even the hypocrite's closer than you are. You get that? If the hypocrite's between you and God, the hypocrite's closer than you are. It's not a good excuse. All right? Now, here's what we want to do. I didn't do it. Bobby did that. Bobby said that. Yeah. I miss him. He's in heaven already, and uh, he beat me by several years, but uh, I miss that old boy. Let's go back here. Verse number four in our text gives the role of the hypocrite. He that saith, I know him, keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, the truth is not in him. Now, here's, here's your choice tonight. You're going to choose whether to act like a hypocrite, like verse 4, or you're going to choose verse number 6, which says, He that saith he abideth in him ought to also, so as he walk, you walk. I'm going I'm to do something. I like doing this. I'm going to tell you all something you're going to do tonight. Like it or not, you are going to do this tonight. I'm saying it. You ready for this? You, everyone in this house, including me, will make a decision tonight about whether you want to be playing the part of the hypocrite or be a disciple. Somebody said, I'm not making a decision. I'll pray about it. I might make my decision next week. No, you'll make a decision tonight. You'll either decide one way or the other. Somebody else says, and, and I hope the door's locked. Somebody else says, I'm not going to make a decision tonight because I ain't even listening. I'm leaving right now. Bingo, I'm out of here. You made a decision. Amen. Every person here tonight will make a decision, and it will be a decision that will affect you personally. You can't make it for somebody else. Somebody else can't make it for you. This is looking better and better. I'm going to give you three verses. Talking about the hypocrite. All I'm going to try, and there could have been 103. There, the Bible is loaded down with stuff about being honest and truthful and being dishonest and untruthful. Hypocrisy versus discipleship. We could have had 100 verses. I'm going to give you three, and these just kind of describe the hypocrite. No word studies, just a verse, and here we go. You ready for the first one? Proverbs 11, verse 9. An hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. Guess what, folks? I, I won't say you ever did this, but I'll say this. Somebody close to you has done this, and you've witnessed it. You ever been around somebody that just tore down somebody? 
Just, just always, just bad mouthing, bad mouthing, bad mouthing. You know what he's done? He's fulfilled Proverbs 11, verse 9. He has destroyed somebody with his mouth. And I said he, but it works for she too. <laughs> Your tongue, James says, is a fire straight out of hell. If your tongue is not tamed, if your, if your tongue is uncontrolled, you will set on fire the course of nature right around you as if it were hellfire itself. The Bible is, is, is plain, very clear about, about hypocrisy, about telling the truth, about character assassination, and it's such a simple thing to do, we don't even have to, we don't even have to think about it. You can just run your mouth for a little while, and if you're not real careful, you will have torn down somebody. I used to counsel folks, just keep your mouth shut. Well, I'm just saying good things. Don't say so many good things. Just keep your mouth shut every once in a while, because the more you talk, the better chance you have of saying something that is not good and is not right and could be something that tears somebody down. You've been around folks that had that kind of yak, yak, yak kind of thing, and they've talked and talked and talked, and when you left, you said, oh, whew, whew, I'm glad that's over with. I don't know how much more I could have taken because it was just constant, constant, constant. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and say this because sometimes, Christian, we use this. Yeah? Brother Allen, I've got a little something for you here, brother. I want you to pray with me about something. You won't believe what Alton said. I tell you, you just won't believe this. But uh, I want you to be my prayer partner. We need to pray for him because I tell you, I'm worried about it. He's going to skirt off and, and he's going to be off in, in some kind of territory here before long. You wouldn't believe what he told me. Let me tell you what he said. This is in confidence. Yeah, God help us. <clears throat> I, I wouldn't say this about Brother Alan, if he wasn't my example, okay? It, just pretend this isn't Alan, but it's somebody else that I use for the example. It won't be five minutes before, and I'll, I'll be him now, before he comes over and he says, Brother Sidney, listen, I'm, I'm not spreading any rumors or anything, but you just wouldn't believe. We need to pray. You know what? And he tells him then, but it's in confidence. Don't say it to anybody else. This, this is not something to be spread around. You've heard that thing? Telephone, telegraph, tele Christian. <laughs> it spread like wildfire. And I'll tell you something else. I can't remember who said this was Moody or Spurgeon or one of those famous guys. He said a lie will go halfway across town before the truth ever gets its britches on to do some traveling. I like that. Verse number two. Job twenty verse five. The joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. The joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. I'm, I'm trying to be careful. I don't want to say anything. You know. There are some folks that if they can spread a little something, it, it just seems to thrill. But it doesn't last. The joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. Now, let's, let's do away with the talking and that kind of thing because I want to go to the real definition of hypocrite. Remember what we said a little while ago? A hypocrite is what? It's a what kind of person? Y'all ain't paying attention. You ain't taking notes. A hypocrite, a genuine hypocrite is a lost person. Now, here's the deal. The joy of the hypocrite only lasts for a moment. He may live out his life, his whole life, and be 90 years old before he dies. That 90 years in, in eternity, that 90 years is just a moment. It's just a drop in the bucket. And all the joy that a lost person has and enjoys and, and can have is going to be about that quick when it's stacked up against eternity. Now let me add the Christian that's acting like a hypocrite that Christian that acts like a hypocrite. 
He may feel really good about himself for a very short period of time, but it's not something that lasts. I want to tell you something. The joy that I got, it's going to last forever. The joy of the hypocrite, just a moment. The joy of the saved person, how long will it last? Into and through and beyond. If, there, if you can go beyond eternity, that's how long it's going to last. The joy of the Lord is what we have, what we possess, and we got it when we got born again. And we, if anybody on top side of earth ought to enjoy themselves and experience real joy, it's the Christian. I made a... <laughs> I shouldn't tell this. This ain't preaching. This is just... I'm going to just tell you a little something. A long time ago, I can't tell you how long, but I made a decision that I was going to try to be cheerful to somebody. I want to, I want to bring some, a smile to somebody. When I was, in, I think it was right after high school, somewhere along in there, my friend's daddy was in the hospital. And we went up to see him. He was serious. And we went up to see him, and we stood there and talked with him a few minutes, and we got ready to leave. And his daddy had talked about how, hurt it, how bad it hurt and how painful it was and how worried he was. He might not live. His heart might not make it through all that. We got out of there, and Paul, my friend, Paul said, let's make a deal right now. And I said, what is it? He said, let's make a deal, make a covenant. He didn't use the word covenant, but an agreement. <clears throat> what he said, if we ever get in the hospital, either one of us, let's try to cheer up the folks that come visit us. Okay, let's don't be like my daddy back there. Let's cheer up the people. And I said, well, Paul, the people that come into the hospital are supposed to be the one cheering up the one on the bed. He said, that didn't work for us, and I did it. We didn't cheer up anybody, and he's got us so far down in the dump. He said, let's just make a deal here that we'll always try to cheer up somebody if we're in the hospital and somebody comes to see us. Somewhere along in there, I wasn't even saved at the time. Somewhere after that period of time, the thing got working, like this, and I'm working. And I've made a decision for me, just me, that I'm going to try my best to cause folks to smile. And the other day I was at Northside Hospital. This, I told this to somebody. If I did, you just don't worry about it. The rest of them hadn't heard it. We were standing there at the elevator waiting, about four or five in the family. We were waiting. And this woman came walking across there, and she was a something nurse. She was, she was in a uniform. She came by there, and, and I said, Hey, how are you doing today? Smile, you know, that kind of thing. She broke into a smile. She said, Oh, I'm doing fine. And so, one of my catchphrases now, I use this a lot. I'll say to somebody that has a good smile, I say, Man, I tell you what, with a smile like that, you ought to do this more often. You could light up a room with that smile. And I said that to her, and she said, oh, it's not me. And I said, I know, it's Jesus on the inside, isn't it? And I figured if, if it wasn't Jesus on the inside, at least I have a chance to witness to her a little bit. Boy, she broke in a big old smile then. I want to make folks happy. I want to make folks have some joy and, and experience a little bit of that. And so I work at that kind of thing. My joy personally is going to last for eternity and if I can help old Allen or somebody else to have joy for just a moment, that'll be a good thing. The hypocrite is going to have no joy. He may think he has joy, but if he has anything that is anywhere close to joy, it's just going to be real temporary, just a moment. One more verse about hypocrites. I can't quote it, so I'll read it to you. Job 8, 13. The hypocrite's hope shall perish. What is the hope of a hypocrite? Well, it ought to be, I hope I get saved, because he's lost. I don't know what hypocrites hope for, but I know what I'm hoping for. His, his hope is going to perish. My hope is going to be eternal. My hope right this minute, and it'll be until Jesus raptures us, my hope is he's coming again soon, and I can hardly wait to see him. Ready to meet him in the air. Glory to God. That hope will not perish. But the hope of the hypocrite will perish. It fades away, dies off. Now, are, are, are you thinking a little bit now? Because in a few minutes, there's going to be invitation time, decision time. Are you already starting to decide which side you're going to wind up on? Okay. There's been enough evidence already, I think, with just three verses, that if, if I hadn't already made my decision... I'd be starting to decide, I don't think I want to be on that hypocrite side. I think I want to decide the other way. You ready? 
All right, that's three things about a hypocrite. Again, you could look up about another hundred verses if you wanted to. There's plenty in the Bible about the hypocrite. Now I want to look at the other side. By the way, oh wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Does anybody know who Nathaniel Hawthorne is? Let me see your hand if you know who Nathaniel Hawthorne is. Boy, there's eight or ten of you literary giants. <laughs> He's the guy that wrote the Scarlet Letter, okay, back in the, I guess it was the 1800s. Nathaniel Hawthorne. I'm going to read you a little quote that he, and it's, it's a little bit kind of old English 1800s stuff, but listen carefully to what he said. This has to do with hypocrites. Uh, you ready? No man for any considerable period can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally becoming bewildered as to which is the truth. Do you know what? A person that tells lies, they'll tell a lie here, move over to here, tell another lie. Move over to here and ready to say something, say, oh, wait a minute. What did I say back here? Uh, what did I say over here? Uh, they're always having to keep up with what's a lie, what have I said, what have I told, who did I tell it to? But you know what? The truth will set you free. If you always tell the truth, you don't have to worry too much about what you said yesterday or the day before. It's going to be truth. But the lie, the hypocrite, the one that plays the part of the hypocrite, that one, if they're not real careful, they look in the mirror, this is my mask for me. Now I get out here and I put on a mask for you. Nathaniel Hawthorne said, it won't be long before we become bewildered and we don't know which one's the real, who's the real me? Young people, probably in their early 20s, usually about second year of college, they run through one of those identity crisis kind of things and they say, who am I? Why am I here? What am I doing? What am I going to do? How can life have meaning? And you know what, folks? That little identity crisis that the young folks have, we're not real careful. It'll carry us into middle age and, and on beyond. And if you're not sure who you are in Christ, you may never know who you are, and where you're headed. There may always be a question mark over your little head, but guess what, folks? In Christ Jesus, following Him, in the light, walking with Him, fellowshipping with Him, guess what? My identity is fixed. I didn't make it up. He did. And He made me a child of His. And now, glory to God, I don't have to worry too much about what mask I was wearing yesterday or day before my mask ought to be Jesus, and it ought to be constant. Now let's look at what a disciple is. Three of these verses. John 8, verse 12, Jesus said, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I want you and me to understand one good, solid thing. If we will walk with the Lord, we'll be walking in the light. There is no need nor cause for us to stumble and stagger around in mental and spiritual darkness. We don't have, we don't have to live like that, folks. Walk with Jesus and take your direction from Him and from His Word, and it will keep you in the light. My Bible said in Psalm 119, Thy Word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. I don't have to be all undecided about everything in life. I've got enough truth in that book right there to carry me through all my life, step by step and day by day. And when I finally lay my, my head down in death, you know what? I'll be able, if I'm still in my right mind, I'll be able to look back and say, you know what? I may, may not have made a real big splash, but I walked with the Lord. And what a time of joy it has been to be His disciple and to follow Him. I think Brother Alton told us here a while back <clears throat> about somebody who <clears throat> said, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong and there is no Jesus and there is no heaven and there is no eternity? What about that? What will you do then? And I think his reply was something like this. If that be the case, I'll just die and rot like you. But you know what? My life down here will have been one of great joy. I will have had a good time and lived a decent life down here. And so, I, golly, just walk with the Lord Jesus. Mm. We are talking this morning about the book. We talk to God by praying. 
I speak to him, and I have the privilege, because I'm his son, of speaking directly to him. I don't have to go through an in-between, some go-between, some priest or some, somebody that, to interpret my prayers. I can talk directly to my God. And then guess what? He can talk back to me. I get plenty of conversation with the Lord right here. Number two, Job 8, verse 12. Let's see, did I... Or is John 8, 12? We already did that. John 12, 26. John 12, 26 says, If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If I'm a disciple following Jesus, there are some benefits. One is I'm in his presence. Hey, is this helping you on your decision making? Hypocrite, no joy, perishing uh, plans and so forth, no hope or walking with Jesus, walking in the light, and I enjoy His presence. You get, you get to two extremes. Tonight, you'll decide which one you want to be. Okay? Even at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, our pastor says, He'll be there for you. Okay? If you're not careful, He'll wear you out at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. But He's there for us. And we don't have to wonder about being, can I get in touch with him at this time of night? The Bible says he never sleeps, never slumbers. He's always there, always available for us. And when I say he's there, I don't mean he's way over there. I mean he's there. He's there for us anytime, day or night. We have access because we are children of God. Second thing in verse 26 if any man serve me, him will my Father honor. All right, number one, I'm in the presence of Jesus. That's a benefit of being a disciple. And number two, and I don't know exactly what this means, but Jesus said it, if I'm walking with him, the Father is going to honor me. I don't know what that means. Not exactly, I got some ideas. But I'll tell you what, I preached one time for a great big Christian school. They must have had 500 students. There's a huge over in somewhere. Tucker or somewhere, I can't remember. When I walked out on the stage, they said, Brother Joe Honeycutt's going to be preaching for us this morning. And all 500 students, like this, and they were clapping and they were whistling. I felt like a rock star, you know. They honored me. They clapped and hooted and hollered, and finally the principal said, Slow it down now or you'll never get to preach. Just, just calm down a little bit. Boy, I tell you, that felt pretty good. I just tell you, it, it felt good. If I ever back off from being a Christian, I want to be a rock star. Because <coughs> I'm going to have a tough time with that since I can't play an instrument and I can't sing. But I like the greeting they get wherever they go. Boy, I tell you, just people all falling out and clapping and hollering. That's great. Jesus said, if you're my disciple and you're walking with me and we're, we're walking in the light, my Father will honor you. I'm pretty sure He ain't going to be clapping for me. But there's some level of honor that I, as a child of God, am promised from my Savior Jesus. He said, my Father will honor you. What does honor mean anyway? You got any ideas about that? Not off the top of your head. I studied it this afternoon. I still don't have an exact idea of what it means for God to honor me. Maybe it's just calling me His child. Maybe it's an honor to just be a part of the family. I'm not real sure, but I like the sound of it. I, I want it, whatever it is. He's going to honor me because I've made the decision to be His disciple and walk with Him and follow Him. I don't have to walk that path by myself. Because there's a crowd of folks here tonight and you're going to make a decision one way or another. And it could be your decision that tonight I'm going to commit to walk with my Lord like I've never done before. I'm saved, no question about it. And I guess probably 98% of you are saved by my count. 98% of you saved on the way. Not a hypocrite. No, no, no. Maybe not even acting the part of a hypocrite tonight. Saved and on the way. 
Whatever it means that God will honor us, I want it. I think you probably want it. And the decision is going to be mine and yours. Will I receive that honor or will I not? And the way I'm going to receive it, as I read, as I read it, I'm going to read it to you again. I'm not even going to trust myself to quote this half a verse. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. So not only have I got the presence of Jesus promised to me by being his disciple, I now also have honor as a part of the promise. And there's one more. Matthew chapter 4, excuse me, verse 19. Jesus again saying, I like it when he talks. Okay, I like it when, when he's saying these things and not just me or some apostle. Jesus said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So there's going to be some level of fruitfulness if I follow the Lord. I can't say that I am winning souls every day of the week, every week. I, I, I can't say that. But you know what? My life and my activity and words that I say and actions that I have, I'm trusting the Lord that that's either a seed being planted or a seed being watered, or every once in a while I get to harvest one. Doug Bass, don't you listen to this part, okay? Do you like this? I was in Kroger the other night. When you go in old Kroger, you take a right, and you... You ain't the boss, I don't have to mess with you. <clears throat> you take a right in Kroger, and you walk through the produce aisle. You hurry through that, and I don't need all that healthy stuff. You take a left, and you're in the bread department. Down at the end of the bread department is where they keep my donuts. They have got the best donuts. Sour cream glazed donuts every time I walk into Kroger. Even if I don't want to, I'm drawn back there and I get me a box of donuts. I was headed for the donut pile. And this couple right in front of me, probably early 30s, they were walking along. He's pushing the buggy. She, she's out in front. She reached in and got one of them boxes of donuts and put it in her buggy. I went behind it. If that would have been the last one, we were going to have a fight in Kroger. But they had a couple more boxes, and I got mine. By then, they were walking down, and they got down to where the chicken parts are, about, about, about that level. And I caught up with them, and I said, Sir, I don't know you, but I want to congratulate you. You have got one intelligent wife. And he looked at me and said, What? I said, That is one smart woman right there. I said, You see this box of donuts? You're going to be eating some donuts just like this. These are the best donuts in the country. And he said, really? I said, yeah. Ask her. She said, that's right. We stood there probably five minutes talking about Jesus, inviting him to church, smiling, all this stuff. What a good time we had in chicken parts division of Kroger, talking first about donuts, then about Jesus, then about church. What a good time we had. I want to follow Jesus step by step and day by day, every day of my life. I have to be honest with you, I did not win those two people to Jesus. But they heard about the death, burial, and resurrection. They heard how much Jesus loved them. And you know what? Somewhere down the line, maybe somebody else will come along and do a little bit of watering. And after a while, somebody may get to pluck that fruit and they might be saved. I just had a little tiny piece in that. Glory to God. I'm going to get a reward. For, I'm going to get a reward for that when I get to heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, and whether they're there or not, it doesn't matter. Jesus is going to take a look at me and say, I saw you at the Kroger that night. I saw you talking to Ori and Victoria. I saw you, and guess what? Here's a little reward, a little soul winner's crown for you. Glory to God. What are we trying to decide now? I'm either going to be a disciple, or I'm going to play the part of the hypocrite. I'm deciding, you're going to decide. I think I'm about done. All right, I got one, one more little quote, and then we're ready to make a decision. You ready for this? This guy's name is Albert Hubbard. He's an American author and a philosopher. That's what I want to be, is a philosopher. I'd like to be one of them. I'd like to be a Christian philosopher. When I was in second year of college, not Bible college, but a regular college. I went to Boca Raton to Florida Atlantic University. And I want you to know I took a course in philosophy. Philosophy 101. 
I made a decision that I was going to become the company philosopher for some big company. And I told my instructor that I wanted one of those little Chinese hats that was pointed on the top, a little round thing, and that they wouldn't even have to buy me a chair because I would sit lotus fashion in the middle of my desk and philosophize. I didn't get the job. <laughs> I did finish basic philosophy. I want to read you what Albert Hubbard, who was a real philosopher, had to say. Listen to this. This is going to help you in just about a minute. He said, it doesn't take much strength to do things. But listen to this. But it requires great strength to decide what to do. I'm going to encourage you. Every person here is going to make a decision. You could have made a decision a while back, and maybe you are a full-fledged, thoroughbred, pedigreed hypocrite, lost and undone and on the way to hell. If that be the case, tonight you'll make a decision. I'm going to stay just like I am. I'm happy with that. Or I'm going to take the high road. I'm going to trust Jesus. There's some Christians here tonight, and most of you, I believe, are probably following Jesus best you can. But there may be some here that would say, you know what? I've played the part of the hypocrite. I, I, I got good testimony over here at the church house. I'm here all the time, bring my KJV up under my arm, and I show up every service. But you know what? On Tuesday, Monday, t Monday through Saturday, it's not the same as what it is over here. So maybe I'm playing the part of the hypocrite. Here's what happens. Tonight, you'll make a decision. I'm going to stay just like I am. I don't care. Nobody knows I'm a phony over here. That's between me and God. And I'm satisfied with that. I'm going to stay just like that. Or maybe somebody would say, you know what? I am. I've known it for a while. But I'm not going to live like this anymore. Tonight, I'm making a decision that I'm going to turn my back on acting like a hypocrite and saying one thing and living some other way. Tonight's the night I'm going to make that decision. Now, there's a bunch of you, I just said it, I'm going to say it again. There's a bunch of you that are saved. You're trying your best to be a disciple of Christ. You're walking with Him best you can. You're loving Him best you can. You're doing the absolute best you can. You also are going to make a decision tonight. Here's the decision. I like it. I'm going to keep it up. It's hard sometimes. Try as I might, I find myself slipping every once in a while and messing up. But you know what? The joy on the inside, is it makes it worth it. I'm going to stick with this thing. That's one decision that you could make. Or you could say tonight, it is not worth it. I am sick and tired of serving Jesus and trying to be consistent with my testimony and my life and all this. I'm sick of it. I'm going to quit. Brother, sometimes you don't say things like that. I'm saying it because they make that kind of decision whether you say it or not. Say, so, okay. So I'm, just, I'm still on your side. I would hope nobody in this house would ever make that kind of a decision that I'm backing up on the Lord and I'm quitting. No. But that is a possibility tonight. You could make that decision if you want to. Now, here it is, and I'm done. Usually when he says I'm done, it's about five, ten more minutes, okay? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say this, and I'm done. I'm really done. The next move is yours. I have coughed up enough truth for you in the last 20 or so minutes that you are well equipped to make a decision tonight for Christ. It's not just a decision for you, it's a decision for Him. What will your relationship to Christ be when you walk out those double doors headed to your house instead of being over here at God's house? The next move is yours. I've done my part. I believe the Holy Ghost has done His part in speaking to your heart while I spoke to your ears. And now absolutely the next move is yours. I'd like to be able to say, I'll make the decision for you because I know what the right decision is. If there's anybody here tonight that's not saved, and by the way, you know this already, it's very possible that somebody that has been walking and serving and doing for years 
might say, you know what? I don't think that was real. I'm not sure I'm saved. Tonight would be the night to fix that, to settle it for once and for all. That can happen. And the rest of us need to make a decision. Disciple, play the part of the hypocrite. That's our decision. And I can't do it for you. If I could, I would. In a heartbeat, in a skinny New York minute, I would do it for you. But I can't. Nor can anybody else. It's you. Between you and the Lord. We're done. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you that you give us the opportunity to be your disciple. You give us the privilege of walking with you and serving you being birthed into your family. Lord, we thank you for all those good things. And now, Lord, as we <clears throat> sing a song of invitation, maybe one or two verses will not extend it a real long time. Lord, the opportunity is there. If somebody needs to make a decision, you speak to them uh, like we cannot. I can't. Brother Alton can't. Nobody else can speak to them like you can. And so, Father, the decisions that need to be made this night, I pray, God, that you'll speak to them in such a way that there'll be, no, there'll be no question that it's you that's speaking to their hearts. And then, God, I pray, like the philosopher said, it's easy to do it, but it's hard to make the decision to do it. And so I pray, God, that you'll give them uh, all the strength that's uh, spiritually that's needed that they make a right decision. Father, help us. Guide us and direct us. Be with us in power now for the next few moments while we sing an invitation song and while the altars are open. And we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do, simply because we've asked it by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to your feet, please. The altar is yours. It's wide open. It's for you. Decision time, October 2, 2016. It's up to you. Come if you will. God bless you.